In the late 1980s, the U.S. state of Virginia was struck by a cruel killer. He was so prolific, so horrible, so extreme. We're not dealing with an ordinary killer. His violent campaign spreading terror. If you're not feeling safe where you are, then just nail your window shut. This place was like scared to death. The murders were slow and sadistic. The strangulation, tightening it, releasing it, reviving or doing it again and again and again. But what drove these heinous crimes? What is sadistically important is that he is in total control over the victim. He was a bad guy. Was the twisted perpetrator born to kill? Richmond is, um, is sort of a compact city. There's a healthy mix of people who are well off and people who are not. In the mid-1980s, the affluent areas of Virginia's capital were far removed from its more troubled neighborhoods. Richmond was sort of a sleepy southern town. Any crime you heard of was gang crime, tucked away someplace in the city that, you know, you just didn't think anybody but the bad guys went to. One seemingly safe haven was the peaceful district of Southside. The homes are old, they're large, made out of brick, you know, and so uh, it's, it's, it's a nice place. But during September 1987, Richmond detective Ray Williams received a call that would shatter this suburban serenity. 10 o'clock in the morning on Saturday, we had a DOA, unusual DOA, strangulation. If it's a strangulation, it's probably somebody she knew because, you know, I have close and personal like that. I'm thinking the first place I'll look is associates and boyfriends. The detective's initial suspicions proved to be wide of the mark as he entered the first floor apartment. First thing I said is, uh oh, I've never seen in my entire career anything like this. I knew that we, we had a special case here. There were certain things that stood out which suggested to us that something ritual um, was going on. As I look in, she's lying face down on the bed, upper torso was hanging off the bed. She had one hand tied behind the other with shoelaces. And they tied them to a point to where they would, if you pull one, you tighten the, the ligature. He then had two socks wrapped around her neck and a 16 inch vacuum cleaning extension twisted in the ligature. The victim, although she was sexually assaulted, was redressed after the crime. There was a large deposit of pure uncontaminated seminal fluid, which could have only come from masturbation. The victim of the horrific attack was 35-year-old magazine accounts clerk, Debbie Davis. Debbie was my bookkeeper. Um, she lived alone. She'd been married briefly and divorced. Warm smile, very engaging, very friendly. Ray Williams and Glenn Williams came to my door. They were here to tell me that she'd been murdered the night before. I think I just nearly fainted. I'd never could imagine anything that could happen to a friend of mine. This sweet woman didn't have an enemy in the world. Faced with a seemingly motiveless murder, investigators attempted to piece together the killer's movements. Of course, we do the, the, the walk around, we check behind the bushes, we check all under here. The intruder's entry point soon became apparent. Then we noticed the kitchen window had a rocking chair below it. Now he balanced that rocking chair right here. Cut the, cut the screen and crawl right in that window. It told me one thing, it told me it would be somebody very agile, somebody very strong. You can see, you know, I'm standing here and the rocking chair is probably, the seat of the rocking chair is no higher than where that bin is. So look at how he's got to, he's got to be strong enough 
to lift himself up and then get in that window. And I'm saying, this guy's got to be a hell of an athlete to be able to be strong enough to do that. And we feel like when he gained entry, he was there waiting for her to come home. The perpetrator would use his time to prepare for the attack. He used materials that were on the scene. He didn't bring things with him. And the killer's use of the homemade tourniquet was chillingly sadistic. And he uh, raped her and choked her, and then she would come to, and he would choke her again, and he repeated this process a number of times. It was particularly brutal. As the details became known, when we found out exactly how he did kill her, it was really awful. It was really, it was really ter terrible. He did awful things. He tortured her. He strangled her and tortured her and watched her die, like squeezing a little baby bird. That's what he did. As detectives investigated the macabre crime scene, they soon realized they were dealing with a meticulous adversary. When I get my reports back from forensics, there's no hair, no fibers, no physical evidence, no nothing. No witnesses, nobody talking about it. The police didn't have any immediate idea how the killer might be related to the victim. Usually they can figure that out fairly quickly. In this case, they clearly didn't. You know, this guy's awfully bold to go in and do the things he did to her with people in the apartments next door. He had nobody heard anything. The Southside residents were shocked by the brutal slaying. But the silent killer was already planning to terrorize their neighborhood again. In September 1987, the Southside district of Richmond, Virginia, suffered a horrific murder at the hands of a sadistic killer. 35-year-old Debbie Davis was strangled in her own home in a prolonged, twisted attack. Police struggled to find a lead, and two weeks later, Detective Ray Williams was called to peaceful Southside once more. Quiet neighborhood, look, hear the birds. It's middle class, nice homes, very low in crime, including burglaries. Very seldom you get a street robbery. The first impression of Dr. Susan Hellam's house told nothing of what lay inside. No evidence of forced entry in the front. Walk in, go back to the kitchen. Didn't see anything disturbed. Police were acting on a gruesome discovery made by the doctor's husband on his return home after a late night at work. Went upstairs, the bed was messed up, the sheets were all in disarray, and I could see the louvered doors on the closet that were open. And as I look over, I could see her hip and legs outside the closet. Dr. Susan Helms, a neurosurgeon at the Medical College of Virginia, was found. She was, in addition to uh, sexually assaulted, identical to Debbie Davis, she was savagely beaten. We're not dealing with an ordinary killer. Actually, we're dealing with a very unique personality. It was clear that whoever uh, had killed her had uh, surprised her somehow. Um, had gotten into the into the home uh, through an open window. The perpetrator had demonstrated exceptional agility. He gained entry. He climbed up the fence on the second floor and cut the screen and climbed in there. I think he's probably hiding in the closet when she gets home. He lets her take her earrings off, he lets her take a watch off, lays it on the table. I think it's when he attacked her. One of the most brutal murders I've ever seen. As with the killing of Debbie Davis two weeks earlier, the intruder had meticulously covered his tracks. Nothing was left, not a fingerprint, uh, not, not a hair, nothing that could be used to identify the perpetrator of the crimes. The only thing that was left were seminal secretions. Investigators were also horrified to discover the sadistic use of a homemade tourniquet. The fluorid petechiae in her eye uh, caused the medical examiner to suggest that the strangulation of her might have taken up to 20 minutes or more. It was a situation of tightening it 
to cause her to um, suffocate, releasing it, reviving her, doing it again and again and again. What is sadistically important is that he is in total control over the victim and having her die slowly and having her suffer and having her know that he is in complete control of her life is arousing to him. And so he's going to try to prolong her agony as much as he possibly can in order to satisfy himself. The unique sadistic traits displayed in both the Southside killings brought police to a chilling conclusion. We knew at that point in time that something was going on. The, the, the rituals, the alteration of the crime scene were identical in both scenes, so we knew we were looking for one person. I said, it's the same son of a bitch killed Debbie Davis, killed her. And I mean, the city went into a panic. Once this was identified as a serial killing, everything in Richmond changed immediately. You could walk through Forest Hill Avenue, every light over there was lit. Every lock, dead boat lock, and every hardware store sold out. We had somebody come in and say to women in particular, if you're not feeling safe where you are, then just nail your window shut. Man, this place was like scared to death. As the pressure mounted, police would turn to the FBI for a profile of the killer, now dubbed the Southside Strangler. We tended to think, quite candidly, that we were looking for a, a white guy, probably about 30 years old, somewhere in that neighborhood. Intelligence, he'd be a loner, he wouldn't talk about his crimes, he'd roam at night. The previous history of this, we didn't know whether it was in Virginia or somewhere else in the United States, but that this wasn't a beginner. This, guy, this was an experienced individual who had done this. As the police investigation progressed, a clue came to light. The victims were unwittingly connected. Debbie Davis worked as a bookseller in a bookstore at a mall. And we went back through all the records and found out that in fact, Dr. Susan Helms had actually purchased books in that store and had written a check to Debbie Davis for a purchase of books in that store. The two victims had frequented the Cloverleaf Mall in nearby Chesterfield County. This entire area here was stores and stuff. People drove up into it and then you could walk into the mall and there were different stores inside. The popular hangout was often bustling with shoppers. But amongst the crowds, a solitary figure would go unnoticed. 25-year-old Timothy Spencer wasn't known to many of the locals. He was over a hundred miles away from his hometown of Arlington, Virginia, a quiet suburb of Washington, D.C. Arlington is a pretty much, a, they call it a bedroom community. It's more residential than anything. It has its areas that, uh, that are uh, more dangerous than, than others, obviously. It's typical of any uh, close-in suburban area of a major metropolitan uh, city. Born in 1962, Timothy Spencer was raised in the Green Valley district of town. There's little small dead-end cul-de-sacs that run up all down through here. I would describe it as a, uh, a lower income neighborhood. However, it uh, has uh, areas where uh, there's very hardworking people lived here for years and years. His mother and his father were both, uh, had some college, they had jobs. Um, they were divorced at some point. Spencer's mother juggled a busy life bringing up her children as a single parent. My mom is the best mom in the world. She provided everything. She spent time with us. We had meals at the table. Uh, so we were pretty much a structured family. As the older sibling, Timothy would naturally look out for his younger brother. It was Christmas and uh, I got an orange bike. 
with the training wheels on it. So we go out on the street, and he was like, hey, first thing we got to do, we got to take these training wheels off. And for about five hours, we just rode around, and he was behind me with his hand on the seat, just, you know, just guide me. And uh, it's funny because I ran right into a car. Boom! <laughs> and um, he said, you can't be looking back at me. You got to keep your eyes on the road and, you know, just a whole spiel. So he was definitely, you know, a, a loving brother. Although quiet, Spencer stood out in the neighborhood. He was gorgeous, man. My brother was, was dynamite gorgeous. I used to be with him and people screamed because he looked so good. Hazel eyes. That's what made him unique. They changed like the weather. He was always quiet around everybody, but when it when when he and I were together, it was you know, we would talk like brothers and laugh and you know tell each other things. And that's my big brother, man. <laughs> A person who becomes singled out because of they're very attractive or they're very unique um, in a way that people respond to and treat as if they're quite special, especially if they're already narcissistic, they will believe that they should be accorded certain treatment. And when they don't get it, they could get angry. Spencer increasingly struggled to conform. His behavior drastically deteriorated during his school years. He was a poor student. He was difficult. He may have been intelligent enough, but did very little in school. At some point when he was, I think, about 12 years of age, he was urinating, he was defecating in the public area in the school. But Timothy's rebellious actions were not confined to childish pranks. He also had history as an arsonist. It kind of is up above where the cul-de-sacs are, uh, that's where he had uh, burned a car. Fire setting gives an individual a sense of control, a sense of power, a sense of domination. Because with a match, you could burn down a building, you could put a car on fire. And this type of powerful control is stimulating for some of these individuals. 13 years later, Richmond's South Side was reeling from two sadistic strangulation murders. And now, just outside the city limits, the killer would strike again. Diane Show, she was a, a young girl, 15 as I recall, and she lived in Chesterfield County. The teenager was a diligent student with her sights set on medical school. On November the 21st, she had ended the day at her computer, studying in her bedroom. It happened on a Saturday, I believe. When I get a call from Chesterfield, I said, Ray, we got a 15-year-old kid strangled and, and tied just like your victims were. On arrival at the Cho's apartment, the Richmond detective would be shocked by the perpetrator's audacity. Her brother was in the next bedroom. Her parents were there when he came in. So he comes in, duct tapes her, ties her brisk and everything. She was actually raped and strangled in her bedroom. The agile killer had struck in the dead of night. The entry point through a window was consistent with his prior murders. And he spent, you know, quite a bit of time in there with her, and uh, apparently he never made enough noise to wake up her parents who were in this house. She was covered um, with a sheet draped across her, mid her, her private areas. Anyone who's posing victims in a specific way is trying to extend the crime scene. They want something to radiate out from their crimes in a way that will uh, make them feel powerful again, just thinking about it. Previous cases had led FBI profilers to suggest that the perpetrator was statistically more likely to be white. But a discovery at the crime scene suggested otherwise. He left one hair inside, rolled up, it was rolled up in a bed sheet. So they collected that and all, all, all they could tell us was it's consistent with being a Negro hair. But as detectives set to work on this long-awaited lead, they were unaware that the killer was about to strike again. During the autumn of 1987, 
the prosperous city of Richmond, Virginia, was struck by a serial killer. The Southside Strangler had thrown the state capital into turmoil with the sadistic killing of three women. Little evidence other than seminal fluids had been left at the crime scenes, although investigators would establish a link between the victims. All had frequented the popular Cloverleaf Mall. Diane Cho lives less than a mile from here. Debbie Davis worked here at a bookstore, and Susan Helms shopped here often. And the Cloverleaf Mall was still a popular hangout for 25-year-old Timothy Spencer. The pensive loner had plenty to reflect on as he seemingly watched the world go by. He had been in trouble of various kinds since he was about nine years of age. He got into crime early and, uh, and stayed in it. Travis Spencer recalls how his older brother's behavior deteriorated on the streets of his hometown of Arlington. It was several guys that uh, pretty much terrorized the neighborhood, and he just happened to be one of them. Now, if thieving was a sport, he would have been number one. If you told me he stole your hubcaps, I would believe that. If you would have told me he stole your eyebrows, I would believe that. My only previous experience with him was the burglary from when he was a, a juvenile. All I remember is that I had to get his mother's permission to get his fingerprints. Because I thought that I had to do that as well to be accepted. I had a friend of mine, we go in the store, we had um, stolen some candy. That guy jumps around the corner and says, stop thieves. So the police came, the officer put us in the back, we get to my house. My mom came to the door and saw it was me and her whole face changed like, no. And when my brother got home, I'm like, yeah, this is our bonding moment. And uh, he looked at me with the seriousness in his eyes and said, you know, don't ever steal. You know, don't be like me. Be better than me. As Timothy Spencer approached his 20s, his escalating career of crime would lead to severe consequences. The eventual burglary that he went to prison for was not too far from here. We're in the South Arlington, the border with the city of Alexandria. I break into a house and the cops caught him inside. That's why he got his time. He was serving time for B&E. The jail part, now that right there, that was the part of me growing up. I used to cry all the time when I used to go see him because you know, I couldn't understand why he was behind there. And as I got older, I understood right from wrong. And if you do wrong, that's where you go. Once you go to prison, it's only two things that can happen. Either you're going to do better or you're going to turn to the dark side. Spencer would be released in September 1987, having served three years in prison. He was placed in a halfway house 100 miles away from Arlington in the Southside district of Richmond. His apartment was one upstairs on the left hand side. It's a transitional house for nonviolent offenders. If they're no, nonviolent, they bring them right after serving a certain amount of time to acclimate them back into society. As Spencer settled into his new surroundings, he would keep the staff and residents firmly at arm's length. He was a loner. He didn't talk to anybody, didn't have any friends. But when he ate, he ate near the end of the table. Would not engage in conversation. If they watched TV, he'd sit on the other side of the room. However, Spencer did cultivate a relationship with a female member of staff. Servicing her car opened up opportunities for the reclusive resident. The only person he talked to was a woman whose car he used to work on so he could drive. Spencer would cruise the local neighborhood and visit the Cloverleaf Mall in nearby Chesterfield County, supposedly returning in daylight hours. Normally on a halfway house, you're let go to go out and work and you have to come back in at night. You're not allowed to go out overnight. But Spencer wasn't playing by the rules. It's supposed to be supervised, checked in, checked out, but it was not run well at all. Timothy Spencer continued to roam the streets at will.
As the residents of Richmond continue to be plagued by the South Side Strangler, a hundred miles to the north, the city of Arlington appeared to be far removed from the killer's grip. We're in a section of South Arlington, a very nice, quiet community. It's very close to Washington. I believe actually that Richard Nixon lived there at one time before he became uh, president. Very, very pleasant and very convenient place to live and very little crime. As the end of November approached, the local community was preparing for Thanksgiving weekend. One such resident was publications editor Susan Tucker. Susan was a young professional, uh, kind of slight of build that uh, uh, was uh, a little quiet uh, and uh, pretty much kept to herself and uh, didn't have a bad bone in her to bear any ill will towards anybody. She was home alone because her husband was on a business trip. As Thanksgiving weekend drew to a close, Arlington detectives were called to Susan's address in the Fairlington district. My partner, Joe Horgus, and I, we were both off duty when we got the call. On the outside, um, it was pointed out to me where it was suspected the point of entry, which was a like a basement window. Underneath these uh, metal balconies, uh, there'd be a small window uh, that's uh, used to ventilate a laundry room or a basement area. Things were ransacked. You come up the steps. Right at the bottom of the steps was uh, a purse that was uh, scattered. The contents of it were strewn around. As the detectives headed to the first floor, they were faced with a scene they would never forget. Susan Tucker was uh, lying nude on the bed uh, with, a, uh, with her hands tied behind her back. And there was a rope going from her hands and feet to her neck. She died from uh, strangulation by ligature. Miss Tucker's body was not found for a number of days, uh, so obviously that's going to add to uh, uh, the unpleasantness of the, of the scene. Terrible, terrible scene. What I remember as much as anything was the horrible smell in the house. The sordid scene would reveal another twisted element to the attack. There was an unusually large amount of semen outside on this blanket or whatever it was. Uh, the thought was that as he was killing her, he was probably masturbating. The gruesome murder bore no witnesses. But the sadistic nature of the strangulation prompted investigators to look to the past. Because there were so few homicides in Arlington and very, very few of that type, as soon as they saw the way the body was with the ropes, uh, they immediately thought of a homicide that had taken place three years earlier of Carolyn Ham. A local man was serving time for Caroline's murder, but with the similarities between the attacks difficult to ignore, detectives were now beginning to question whether the right man had been convicted. Carolyn Ham was found with a, a rope going from her neck up over a pipe down to the bumper of a car. She was tied with her hands behind her back. Investigators also recalled a string of unsolved sexual attacks that had featured similar sadistic traits displayed in the murders of Carolyn Ham and Susan Tucker. I knew that there was a rapist who was working the area, breaking into uh, apartments. They called him the uh, black masked rapist. He was so prolific. He was in a home with his ropes, waiting for a woman to come home had to be one of the scariest things that imaginable. I called the FBI profile unit. They agreed that the odds are that this black rapist is my murderer. And they gave me some vital information that when the first girl was raped, 
The perpetrator took her from one area and took her to another area. There's a real good chance that the suspect lived in that area because he would have taken her to someone somewhere where he was comfortable. The reason they're within a comfort zone is because they're trying to do this in a way that they won't get caught. They know the streets, they know uh, you know, the patrol cars, they know various things about the buildings that they might be entering and the, and the person they've been following and the person who seems to be vulnerable. So there, there'll be kind of a buffer area around their immediate home or business. As Arlington detectives focused their efforts, potential suspects were whittled down. There was someone that had been bothering me five or six years earlier who was doing burglaries. All of a sudden, I remembered Timmy. Timmy, and then Timmy Spencer came. The 25-year-old career criminal had been brought up in the Green Valley area of Arlington. His family home was located just a short distance from the site of the first rape in 1983. Detectives also established that the 25-year-old Arlington man had recently been released from prison. So we called up uh, the parole office, and that's where we found out uh, that he was actually in a halfway house in Richmond. And then, of course, um, we became involved with Arlington, and we started to piece all this together. We met with Detective Ray Williams, it would soon become apparent that Spencer could have been responsible for far more than the succession of rapes and murder of Carolyn Ham. Arlington and Richmond detectives discovered shocking similarities between the more recent murders in the two districts. The movements of Timothy Spencer were also impossible to ignore. You got the signer cheats from halfway house. Every time he was signed out, coordinated with every murder. Not only did he sign out for every one of the murders down in Richmond, but he requested and received a furlough or whatever it is to come to Arlington for Thanksgiving the weekend that Susan Tucker was killed. As detectives delved into Spencer's history, they would discover a disturbing pattern of behavior. The big circumstance that came to mind during the FBI's profile was the uh, arson. Every indicator shows that he went through a transition of escalation. He started as breaking into homes, and then he would break in and he would defecate and so forth and so on, and he gradually grew. There were many where he broke into one house and then took things and went next door and waited for a woman to come home. Often somebody who becomes a sexual offender starts with sexual burglary because it's a, it's like an experiment to see if they can, you know, what they can get away with. If they enjoy that, they will now progress to trespassing against the person, which usually is some kind of molesting or rape. Um, and then, then that can lead to torture, sex torture or uh, murder. Having established a clearer picture of their suspect, police made the decision to take Spencer in. We were on the street outside the halfway house when he came. We walk in, cuff him, take him to headquarters. I interviewed him for 12 hours. He never admitted anything. I don't know what you're talking about. He spoke well. He uh, didn't use a lot of street slang. There were times when I would thought, you know, do we really have the right guy? But I, th I think for the most part, we were pretty confident we did. However, the horrific crimes had been perpetrated by a careful and calculating killer. With limited circumstantial evidence to call on, there was a danger that Spencer might yet walk free. Following a series of sadistic sexual murders in Virginia, Arlington and Richmond police had combined forces to arrest Timothy Spencer at a halfway house. The detective's case was based on circumstantial evidence, but recent advances in forensic science would offer them an unprecedented opportunity. As far as I can tell, it goes down in US history. We were the first DNA murder case. 
Although police were dealing with a meticulous adversary, they were hoping to match Spencer's blood sample with deposits of semen found at the crime scenes. We immediately arrested him, we got his DNA, we checked it, and of course everybody was holding their breath until, oh, when is the sample going to come back? Back then, it took several weeks. You know, we, we would sit around and wait. If there wasn't a match, then it wasn't Timothy Spencer. And to be honest, we were all going to have egg on our faces. But it matched. It matched to the crime in Arlington. It matched to uh, two of the three crimes in Richmond. So we had three cases with DNA evidence. Forget about who it was. We knew who it was. It was then, how do we convince the jury? Police continued to build their case. They had observed Spencer's movements at the Cloverleaf Mall, a location that had been frequented by three of the victims. Sat in the middle of the mall for hours, watching the women. Just look at them. We'll just sit there and watch. Watch them walk by. Never bought a thing. Like a chameleon. He just blended in. Didn't cause any problems. He obviously was very meticulous in picking out his targets. Once he picked one, he would walk behind and watch stores she went into. We were able to produce some evidence that showed that this may be the location where he would pick these individuals out. Between July 1988 and June 1989, Spencer would face charges for the rapes and murders of four women in Arlington and Richmond. Although implicated in the murder of Carolyn Hamm and the series of Arlington rapes, prosecutors decided to try him on only the most recent murders. I never saw any, any indication that he was at all troubled uh, by what he was hearing in court. He just sat there. Disturbingly, the defendant would come to life as prosecutors distributed images from the horrific crime scenes. He wanted to see those pictures. I mean, he was actually, defense tables here and the jury boxes here. He's actually leaning over, looking at every picture. Timothy Spencer was so bad, there was no way in the world that even as opposed to the death penalty as I was, I was going to take a chance on him ever getting out on the street again. He was a bad guy. Spencer was found guilty of the murders of Richmond residents Debbie Davis, Susan Helens, and Diane Cho and of Arlington resident Susan Tucker. The man previously convicted of Carolyn Ham's murder would be pardoned and released. As Spencer was placed on death row, the question remained, how have this serial burglar and rapist ended up as the most sadistic of killers? That was the hardest part of the whole situation. Like I said, you told me something about some stealing But murder, I never could see my brother actually murdering somebody. He was a very angry person, a controlling person. He wanted to control people. He obviously hated women for some reason. It's not the sexual part of the crime that's, is, that doesn't give them the satisfaction. For some reason, they've, they've harbored this inner anger towards women. He's escalated to his torturing people. The torture part is part of the anger and releasing that anger toward your victim. It's like an experiment to see if they can, you know, what they can get away with. Once they have someone and they've subdued them and they know that that person's not going to escape, they want to prolong that feeling of power over this person. But what was the root of this twisted fury? Was Timothy Spencer a born killer? think something wasn't really right in the in the mind if somebody's ill that's treatment that needs to be with medication some some doctoring me growing up in that household he was definitely ill we don't see any genetic thing that make, turns a person into a sex murderer but if he's also a predatory psychopath 
we certainly are finding that there are brain factors in terms of areas of the brain that don't inhibit aggression and areas of the brain where moral decision making is made that that are atrophied so you get a sex killer who's also a psychopath it's more likely that person will become an aggressive offender I wouldn't say he's a born killer but that deviant sexual arousal pattern is certainly hardwired and with other events and in individuals uh, development and childhood could set the stage for somebody to act out Timothy Spencer was executed at the Greensville Correctional Center on April the 27th 1994 they called me they said you're coming down I said no I deal in death every day and it's just a legal way for the state you're still killing somebody I mean I'm not, I'm not saying he didn't deserve to die because he'll never kill anybody else but I still have mixed emotions about death penalty that day phew. yeah I was there I was there the last day on this earth when they told us we had two minutes left to talk to him you know for you to be sitting there with a person perfectly healthy they damn near had to pry us apart I do remember the day that he was to be executed it was a very unusual day for me and I remember not being able to speak to people all day long and just carrying it around with me remembering my friend for many the actions of this sadistic killer are simply a terrible chapter from the past but for some the pain lives on I think that to be able to do what he did and to murder my friend in the method that he did he was an absolute monster he was the personification of evil most evil person he was certainly the worst person that I encountered in the 25 years or so that I was in that uh, kind of uh, environment you have those nights where you dream of them and you wish you could just hold them and hug them and they're just not there they're just not there wake up out your dream crying nine times out of ten he did what he did no doubt about that we can't erase it we all are crime victims. Life still goes on, and you know it's, it's still a constant struggle. And I'm sure the victims' families, you know, they're struggling as well. You know, nobody's a winner in this situation.